Make yourself look big. Hey! Announce yourself. Hey, hey, hey! Repeat if necessary. And teach someone else in... At this time, we'll open up the Garden Grove City Council. Ms. Uh, Baylor, would you please call roll? Council Member Beard? Here. Council Member Jones? Here. Council Member Fawn? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Wynn? Here. Mayor Broadwater? Here. Okay, it's my understanding that uh, we'll, okay, we'll have the invocation first by Ms. Susan Emery, and then we'll have the uh, Pledge of Allegiance by uh, Councilman uh, Jones. Dear God, we gather to make decisions for our community. May we use only our best skills and judgment, keeping ourselves impartial and neutral as we consider the merits and pitfalls of each matter that is placed before us and always act in accordance with what is best for our community and our fellow citizens. Amen. 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 Please face the great flag of our nation and say the pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, at this time, we just came out of closed session. We had two issues that we listened to, and at this time, we have nothing to report. Uh, it's my understanding that we have some presentations this evening. Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor, and I'd like Susan Emery to make the presentation this evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and cities of members of the City Council. This evening, the Garden Grove City Council is pleased to shine the community spotlight on the 2012-2013 Miss Garden Grove and Miss Garden Grove's outstanding team and their courts of honor. They proudly served and represented the city during their reign from August 2012 to August 2013. As an official preliminary to the Miss America pageant, the Miss Garden Grove pageant distributes over $5,000 in scholarships to local young ladies each year. In addition to performing in a talent competition, each contestant delivers a platform based on a current issue she feels is important. I would like to call forward each honoree and give a brief presentation. We ask that each of you stay up front after being called so a group photo can be taken. We also ask that the audience wait until the end for applause. Would Miss Garden Grove 2013, Missy Mendoza, please step forward. Missy, a native of Garden Grove, is pursuing her bachelor's degree in communications from Cal State Fullerton. She uses her strong leadership skills in her sorority and holds the position of spirit chair. Her sorority helped raise $21,000 for the school's philanthropy program, Camp Titan, which sends underprivileged children in the area to Big Bear for one week where they learn leadership skills. Missy's passion for the arts has driven her pursuit in vocal training. She has been singing for the past 10 years and attends weekly vocal lessons. She is a proud alumna of Garden Grove High School and was involved in many extracurricular activities, including being a member of the National Honor Society. During her year of service, she volunteered for the Children's Miracle Network and spread her platform of prevention and awareness of driving under the influence throughout the city. She was sponsored by the Garden Grove Elks Lodge 1952. Representing the city and community with Miss Garden Grove were her court members, Julia McCurdy, Christy Genta, and Robin Suarez. Would the three of you please come forward? Julia McCurdy placed first runner-up in Miss Garden Grove 2013. She is a graduate from Pacifica High School and is currently attending Orange Coast College for her Associate Arts degree. Whittacombe Enterprises was her sponsor. Christy Genta placed second runner-up in Miss Garden Grove 2013. She's a graduate from Garden Grove High and is currently attending Fullerton College for her associate's degree in business marketing. Grove Body Shop was her sponsor. Christy is competing for the title Miss Garden Grove 2014 and is currently sponsored by the Garden Grove Firefighters Association. Robin Suarez placed third runner-up to Miss Garden Grove 2013. She's a graduate from Pacifica High School and is currently majoring in biology from Cal State Fullerton. 
Carolina's Italian restaurant was her sponsor. She is competing for the title Miss Garden Grove 2014 and is currently sponsored by Azteca Mexican Restaurant. In addition to Miss Garden Grove and her court, the City Council would like to recognize Garden Grove's Outstanding Teen 2013 and the Teen Princesses. Would Outstanding Teen 2013, Karina Valdez, please come forward. Karina is currently a senior at Pacifica High School. Her passion for dance has led her to become actively involved in her school's dance team. Karina currently maintains a 4.5 GPA and has taken numerous honors and advanced placement courses. Her goal is to graduate at the top of her class and attend New York University, where she hopes to appear on Broadway as a performer. Karina is deeply devoted to her platform, Self Image. She hopes to inspire confidence and boost self-esteem in young girls struggling with insecurity. She was sponsored by Orange County Ophthalmology. Would Teen Princess Isabella Garcia please step forward? Isabella Garcia is a sophomore at Orange County High School of the Arts. She loves to dance and enjoys photography. She was sponsored by the Colony of Performing Arts. Teen Princess Peyton Rice could not make it tonight, and she sends her gratitude to the City Council. Over the past year, Miss Garden Grove and Miss Garden Grove's outstanding team, along with their courts, have participated in a variety of community events and service projects. They included the Christmas tree lighting cere celebration, Strawberry Festival, and the Garden Grove Community Foundation's Summer Concert Series. At this time, the Mayor and City Council would like to present the Miss Garden Grove Scholarship Pageant Outgoing Courts with certificates and mementos in recognition of their volunteerism in the community during their 2013 reign. The City Council wishes you the best and hopes that your aspirations continue leading you to recognize success. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Do you have film in that camera? <laughs> okay, thank you.
We have a Boy Scout out here. Would you like to stand, sir? <laughs> what troop are you with? Uh, troop uh, 75. And you're here for what reason? Um, for my, uh, my communications merit badge. Okay, well, nice to have you with us, young man. Thank you. Uh huh. Greg Durfee. Oh, we're going to have oral communications. Greg, you're up. My name is Craig Durfee, 9331 Salini Avenue, Garden Grove, California. Honorable Mayor, Council, and staff, I appreciate all your patience in this last four months. I'm grateful to all of you who have served in our community, uh, especially uh, one of the council members who knows me through communications. Um, I'm here tonight to request that we put on the agenda council and planning and traffic uh, commission uh, to address these issues of urban uh, active transportation. There are October 1st federal funds and state funds by the transportation of secretary guaranteed $24 million for safe route to school. Long Beach did this in a $500,000 grant. They're teaching every uh, student how to ride a bike, how to get there to and from school safely, and I have documents to support this. Um, and I think that uh, having asked the council to hear a resolution become a safe, friendly bicycle community and meeting the traffic commission with a coalition of the Gargoyle School District and the city council is to address the uh, future of AAA is going to be pursuing this. Uh, next year I have a relationship with government affairs. This active transportation is going to be a big thing in the future with your density of downtown. Police departments of LA have pursued this as a bicycle uh, communication within the bicycle community and also better enforcement. There's a lot of uh, documentation. I would ask that you put this on the agenda and all forums and come with a coalition of various uh, entities to uh, move forward to get the funds and also to uh, bring a, a lot calmer Green Lane Street project that has been done across the United States. And I'd ask for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. Josh McIntosh. Amyung Haseo, aloha. I bet you heard a lot of that lately. Well, welcome back. When you guys left, the whole nation fell apart. The government shut down. So uh, thanks for returning. We hope things will get back to normal soon. I wanted to bring up a few points tonight. Uh, one of them is that uh, this Friday night on Main Street, in conjunction with our um, weekly cruise, we're going to have a grand opening for the Motorsports Cafe. That's a coffee shop that's taken over the old Yaba Java. Well, uh, they're going to have a grand opening party. There's going to be a DJ, really good one there. And uh, I think you guys should all try and make it out if you can. It's going to be from 6 o'clock until 9 o'clock this Friday on Main Street. Also, another cool thing happening in Garden Grove is on the 19th at our Historical Society, I believe it's the 19th and the 20th. I'm working it. I should know it, but uh, I'll check my calendar at home. We're having a Civil War reenactment. This is free and open to the public. There will be uh, Civil War uh, soldiers representing both sides of the conflict there. It will be educational, informational, and fun. Please uh, get your family and come on out and learn something. Turn off the TV for a minute, kids. Come out and learn something. Another thing coming up is uh, the Garden Grove Neighborhood Association meeting October 17th. Uh, for people who like to uh, be familiar with what's going on in the city, have their voices heard, and uh, participate in local politics, we'd like to invite you, especially all of our uh, elected officials out here. Uh, please come out and participate. Another event coming up is the IndieFest USA Film Festival. First off, as one of the organizers, I'd like to thank the city for participating this year, getting on board, and helping us to have our festival. This is our third year in Garden Grove. For those of you who may not know about it, we'll be having over 70 movies, 15 musical acts, and uh, 
All the music acts are free. This is going to be in the Village Green Park. We're also going to be showing a uh, real Hollywood movie, not an indie film, each night in the Garden Grove Village Park where the Strawberry Festival is held. And this is our way of saying Garden Grove. We are trying to do everything we can to reinvigorate downtown. And um, it's going to be awesome. We're going to have uh, festivities starting at 4 o'clock each day throughout this weekend, shutting down at 10 o'clock, in which, of course, that time we'd like to bring everybody to Main Street and go to a, one of our fine restaurants there. Now, throwing or organizing an event of this size has been a real challenge. Uh, we've got projectors, we've got movie screens, we've got bands, we've got stages, we've got so many things to uh, coordinate. It's been a real pain in the butt. So for everybody out there, we could use some more sponsorships. Um, for all of you who are very good at fundraising, we'd like your help if you have any friends with in good positions. I remember uh, Mr. Hardin stood up here and pledged his support when he wanted his freeway sign up. And he said that he would uh, definitely donate to the community and help us out. Well, Mr. Hardin hasn't been answering his phone. And there's a whole <laughs> lot more like him out there. So if you have any connections, tell them we're, uh, we've got a great community event and we could use their help and support. Their name will get on a stage. You know, we'll put their name in lights. So uh, I'm really trying to hold off on saying something here tonight, but I'm going to do it anyways. For those at home, the armchair politicians that don't show up to city council meetings, that don't voice their opinions, but like to uh, blog about these things with fake names that they hide behind and pick us all apart, good evening. I'm sorry you couldn't make it again tonight. And uh, lastly, I'd like to close this meeting in honor of Justin Luke Valdez, a former Argonaut. He passed away. He was murdered September 23rd in San Francisco. He was a fellow Argonaut. He had so many great things going for him. And I think it would be great if we acknowledged that tonight. I think we did close last week, uh, two weeks ago, in his name. It's worth it. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Peter Katz. Peter, some people say you've gone to the dogs. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Vietnam War Museum of America, uh, once again, I want to uh, promote a couple events that we're sponsoring to raise some money uh, for our, muse our great museum that will be a proud moment in this city's history. On Wednesday, the 23rd of October, uh, the world, the um, Vietnam uh, uh, Museum Foundation is presenting a golf tournament and awards dinner and silent auction at the Naval Golf Course in Seal Beach. Uh, if you contact the city's website, you can get more information, but there's some great silent auction prizes out there, including uh, two Southwest Airline tickets uh, anywhere that they fly. So uh, it's $50 per person, but it's going to be a wonderful event. You don't have to play golf. This includes dinner. But for the golfers out there, we can use some more golfers out there. And this is a great event to promote the uh, museum once again. And we are kicking off our speaker series. This is the second year for our speaker series. This year we're concentrating, last, uh, last year we concentrated on some of the American soldiers that fought in Vietnam to defend freedom uh, of the South Vietnamese people and uh, to defend the United States of America. This year, we're going to be featuring some of the Vietnamese heroes that helped fight along our side and some that are still serving in America. And the first speaker, Thursday, November 14th, 2014, at 6.30 p.m. at the Courtyard Center right up the street here on Main Street will be Quang Pham. He's a refugee, but he's a United States Marine author. Quang Pham is a business founder and owner popular public speaker and award-winning author who has appeared on numerous radio and television shows offering reflections on Vietnam. His book, A Sense of Duty, traces Quain's uniquely spiritual yet agonizing journey from his experience as an uprooted refugee to becoming a United States Marine Corps combat aviator 
and reveals the turmoil his family faced and uh, what torn his life apart and how he served his country and his greatness towards and thanks for his American service. So I want to thank him. He's a fellow soldier. And this is what makes this country great. Tonight we saw a bunch of young students, their whole lives set out in front of them. Uh, and we are in negotiations with the uh, Vietnamese Student Association of Southern California. But I want to address another hero that some of you may not know, but you will on Friday when Stockholm will announce she will be the winner of the 2013 Nobel Peace Prize. This young lady placed her life on the line. Uh, her name is Malala Yousafzai. She was an 11-year-old girl that stood up to the Taliban in Pakistan when they came aboard her bus and shot her in the face three times because she wanted young girls to go to school. Today, 57 million children do not go to school in this world, and most of those are women and young girls. And this young lady is so, was so brave, one bullet entered her eye socket and lodged in her shoulder, the other two bullets ricocheted off the sides of her faces and hit her friends on both sides of her. She went to several transplant operations, and today she was at Buckingham Palace to be received by the Queen. Next month she will be coming to the White House in the United States to be honored by the President of the United States for her bravery, standing up for young students all over the world for the right to have an education and to go to school and to live their dream. So the dreams that we fight for here Remember, freedom is never free. And uh, all these young children here, all our combat soldiers around the world, these young ladies we saw here tonight, uh, their dreams are protected by our soldiers out in the field. And those soldiers are made up of many colors and many races. This is Hispanic Heritage Month. And you can look at the number of Hispanic soldiers that have fought here and never became citizens, and yet they were soldiers of America. So let's not forget freedom is not free. Thank you. Thank you. John Wildsmith. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council, staff, and citizens of Garden Grove. I'm uh, here to expand on something Josh mentioned. Uh, I'm representing Garden Grove Neighborhood Association. We are starting a series, a mini-series of town hall meetings featuring notable uh, speakers from our community. Uh, the first one is in fact going to be held on uh, week on Thursday, October 17th at Garden Park Elementary School, uh, 6562 Stanford Avenue. Um, the purpose is to uh, obviously um, inform the neighborhood uh, you know, with the guest speakers and also to raise funds for Garden Grove Neighborhood Association. Um, our speakers starting this very first uh, of the series, uh, Chief, uh, Police Chief Kevin Rainey uh, will be uh, starting at 7 o'clock and followed by uh, Dr. George West, um, President of the Garden Grove Board of Education. Uh, Dr. West will in fact introduce uh, Gabriella Maffey, Dr. Maffey, uh, who's currently Superintendent of the Board of Education. Um, Chief Rainey will be bringing along Lieutenant uh, Body, so you get two Kevins for the price of one there. Um, we, we're asking people to don't cook that night. We have uh, two lunch trucks there, uh, Dos Chinos, Latin Asian grub, it's uh, fusion food. Not quite sure what uh, Latin and Asian means, but uh, um, you know, buy food from the lunch trucks because uh, some of the proceeds will go to the Garden Grove Neighborhood Association. Also there for dessert, Mustache Mike's Italian ice cream. Um, I think that's all I have to say at the moment. I might just add that uh, Dr. West, for instance, um, if people don't know him. We all know the police chief, of course, but Dr. West is currently the dean of the College of Education at Hope International University. He's a retired school teacher, and uh, he has a BA and MA degrees at uh, Cal State Long Beach, and a, his doctorate was from the U University of Laverne. Um, and Dr. Uh, Murphy... Uh, 
uh, I think she was introduced to us a few months ago here. So they will be there speaking as well as uh, Chief uh, Rainey and Lieutenant Body. Uh, we hope everybody will come along, you know, support the Garden Grove Neighborhood Association. Um, don't cook, just buy your food from the lunch truck and uh, enjoy a good evening. It's a uh, little, you know, the speakers will speak and there'll be question and answer opportunities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Larry Tupa. Good evening. I'm here to represent a lot of friends and neighbors in West Garden Grove. The very short uh, topic is going to be coyotes. We've had a number of our friends and neighbors that have lost their cats, dogs, etc. And it really is a big issue, and it's getting quite, it, well, Quite frankly, it's getting worse because of the concerns of the people. Even when you have a six-foot block wall and you're finding out that you have a coyote that's uh, crouching on the top of that wall ready to pounce on your 10-pound dog, you know, that's something to worry about when you can't even use that backyard anymore for your pet. Five years ago, 7 a.m. in the morning, I was taken... Our Charlie, our little white 10-pound Bichon, for a walk in broad daylight. And up ahead, we live on 6,000 block Killarney Avenue in West Garden Grove. And I looked up ahead, and on the sidewalk coming towards me was what I thought was a stray dog. Well, he kept coming, and so as a precaution, I lifted our dog up fully, and then as the dog, the so-called dog got closer, it turned out to be a coyote. And uh, he kept coming. And uh, we saw the fine little movie uh, on hazing. Well, that didn't work that, uh, that morning, okay? Because I did my yelling and whatever, but the coyote kept coming. And he actually didn't veer off the sidewalk at all. He literally brushed against the side of my leg Fortunately, uh, Charlie was up high enough, and I, 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 obviously the coyote wasn't very hungry because he kept on going. But anyhow, um, another issue, um, they had a, a problem in Griffith Park about a year ago where um, a coyote attacked a five-year-old little girl, and it was in the process of carrying her away to the bushes. However, Fortunately, her mother was there, the little girl's mother was there, and she was able to grab onto the child, and she had the coyote pulling on one end, one end and she on the other end, and, and fortunately the coyote let go. So, anyhow, my point is this. We have, we have a problem up here where if you, if you have an urbanized animal that is no longer afraid of people, and doesn't have enough food to eat, when he runs out of cats and dogs, he's liable to turn on one of your kids or one of your grandkids, okay? And I guess what I'm hoping is not going to happen up here is that we are maybe uh, going to come up with a plan not to coexist with these wild animals, but come up with a plan to get rid of them. Any tracker or hunter that's worth his salt can find a coyote lair without a problem at all, okay? It's very easy to do. Sure, we have the excuses. We have these, uh, these area, freeway areas that have been bulldozed and bridges built and they're moving around, etc. But hey, that's where you look for them. Okay, they're not they're not nesting they're not nesting in my backyard or the neighbors. They're in these areas, and if you want to find them, you can. But again, I'm I'm not talking just for myself. I'm talking for a lot of people in our area that, quite frankly, are just kind of fed up with this problem. It's been going on for quite a while. And in closing, I would like to ask: 
what plan do you have to get rid of them? Any response? We, we don't respond to you. We're going to address your issue when you after a while. But this is not a discussion or a debate or anything like that. You've made your point. We've listened to you. And we've got a few other people on the same issue. We'd like to hear all of them, please. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Okay. Kim Moore. Hi. I'm nervous. It's my first time doing this, so please bear with me. We haven't lost anybody in a long time. <laughs> okay. So um, I did have an experience with a coyote. Um, we've lived in West Garden Grove. You live in Garden Grove. <laughs> Surprising, huh? On the um, south side of Bell Intermediate. And we've always had pets and uh, never had a problem with worrying about them being in the backyard uh, unattended. But um, March 19th, I had taken the dogs out about 9.15 to the backyard and hung out with them for a little bit. And then I went to the side of the house into the garage to put a load of wash in. And then I heard them barking, barking, and which they do a lot. And so I tried to call them into the garage. And um, the one little one came in. And I kind of wiped him off to put him in the house. And then he got down and ran back out. Anyhow, um, by the time I went out there to see what was going on, uh, the coyote had the little dog in his mouth, in his mouth by the neck. And, um, of course, I mean, my reaction, I just screamed. And he, he dropped the t the, our dog and uh, ran. And we have an eight-foot fence because we built our fence up. And I didn't see him come over it, but obviously he, he got over it. And then he, you know, um, scurried back over and into the um, field at Bell. So, you know, of course, I take him to the vet. and gets examined and treated and everything. And, you know, there goes $100. And then we got to quarantine him uh, 30 days for rabies in case he happened to catch rabies from, even though he's up on his shots and he got a booster that day and so on. So that was, uh, luckily, I have a job that's flexible. I could stay with him. Uh, enough and not have to pay to have him quarantined for that. But that would have been another added expense for me. Um, so luckily he was okay. He didn't end up with rabies. Um, I don't think it's right that we're expected to, uh, well, I think it's right we're expected to immunize our pets and spay and neuter our pets. But allowing these coyotes to just roam, um, you know, as they will, unimmunized, you know, possibly giving our pets rabies. I mean, even if they're immunized, which I didn't know, they can still contract rabies, even if they had, they're up to date on the rabies vaccines. That's what the vet told me. So um, it's not a guarantee. It's not 100%. Uh, I think whoever thinks that it's okay for the coyotes to exist in our neighborhood uh, should immunize them, spay and neuter them, and monitor them. You know, it's not fair that we, you know, I can't let my, my dogs in the backyard anymore without me. When nobody's home, they have to stay in the house in, the whole time. Again, I've lived there, you know, almost 30 years. We never had that problem. You know, and of course, more and more people, you hear stories. Something's happening. I don't know what. I don't know why there are so many more. I don't know if the litters are bigger. I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not an exterminator, but... Again, something needs to be done. Um, it's not right that they have more rights than we do. So, uh, you know, I, again, like I said, I'm not an exterminator, but anything we can think of, trapping, relocating, I know they have to be relocated far from what I've read, uh, to not come back, spay, spaying and neutering, sterilizing them, um, you know, if they're hard to catch, I would think you put bait out anywhere, they're going to come. And, you know, get a, get a um, what do you call it, tranquilizer gun. Shoot them, put them in the van, and take them away. They don't need to be here. You know, they're going to come back. I know, eventually, it's not a, it's not a, a permanent solution. But there's a problem right now. And, and at least if we can, 
alleviate some of that for the people who live here and um, want to have pets and want to have the freedom that, that we had before. Uh, I hope I hope we can do something. And I have, um, I guess I'm supposed to give this to her, like a, an article I just came across, something they did in Chicago with trapping, and it may be helpful. That's it. Christine Case. Hi, it's my first time, too. <clears throat> I kind of started this whole mess with the coyotes because I'm, I'm on Facebook, and we started talking. We got a neighborhood watch group together on Facebook, and more and more people started posting, and more and more people, and more and more people. And I came to find out that it's really, really bad in the west side of Garden Grove. Um, every single day, somebody posts that they've lost their cat, They've been attacked. Their dog's been attacked. They found one in their garage. They found one in their backyard. Um, nowhere safe anymore. Um, I personally have not seen one, and I joke with my husband that I don't believe that they're here because I haven't seen one. And then I get on Facebook, and I hear of another neighbor that's lost their cat or their dog. And um, uh I don't know why the coyotes have taken over our neighborhood, but I do know that in the animal kingdom, every animal has a predator, and, they, and then there's prey. The coyotes have no predators, and so they just keep coming, and they just keep coming. It's really easy to do the hazing, you know, do the little dance that didn't work and all that. That's really funny, but nobody's up at 4 o'clock in the morning to haze them when they come into the neighborhood and they take our cat or they take our dog. Um, I don't have a doggy door anymore. We were talking about putting one in, and now I'm not going to. Uh, we get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I can't put my dog out to go to the bathroom without walking outside first to make sure, because our backyard fence, um, we back the 22 freeway, so we have the ditch. So we have a freeway of coyotes, I'm sure, behind us. Um, Maybe they haven't come into our yard because my dog is, he's in prison. He can't go out front. When we take him for a walk, he is on a leash where my husband actually is touching his fur as they walk. And I walk behind him with a walking stick that has um, a little stabbing thing. I don't know what, it's a pointer that if any coyote comes near me, they're going to feel the pain. I I will try screaming because that's what I do. But um, but I want to ask you this. If we had a pack of wild Dobermans or pit bulls or Rottweilers, not to pick on any breed, but if we had a pack of wild animals that were going around and attacking people and dogs and things, we wouldn't just sit here and say, oh, but it's okay, because it's not okay. It's not okay to lose my cat or my dog to any animal. Um, I have... Um, I've got someone else that's going to speak about this, but I did some research on the Internet about um, a lady in Rossmore was jogging, and she was attacked by two coyotes. And what they did was they had one on one side of her that was growling and, and coming forward, which distracted her while this one lunged at her. So then she turns to this one, and then this one lunges at her, and that's how, that's how they do it. So it's not one coyote anymore. It's two, three, and I've even heard people say they're four in a pack now. And if you go on the Internet, you'll find videos. Um, my friend posted an awful video of someone in their front yard. They went outside to say hi to somebody, and two coyotes walk up onto their driveway right in their front door and attack their poor little dog. And it's black and white. You can't hear the screaming but you can see the blood everywhere of this poor animal. And I can only, I just, I can't even imagine if something happens to my dog. So um, I just don't want to live in fear anymore. I want to be able to enjoy my backyard. I want to be able to take my dog for a walk again. So thank you. Thank you. Sharon Mesnaris? Menaris. Menaris. Hello, everybody. Thank you for serving our community. We appreciate you. Um, I've been on the west side going on 40 years now. Sharon, we can't hear you. 
this year I'll be over there 40 years. And I've never had a coyote issue. We, we have a neighborhood watch over there on Facebook that currently has 1,680 people. And we talk about issues going on in the neighborhood and how to solve them. And like Christine said, we have a lot of coyote problems. I, too, have dogs. I, too, have to lock my dogs in the house when I leave for work and not allow them access to the yard. We, they roam through the neighborhood. I went through our Facebook page started in February with two people, and it has grown exponentially. And I went through and logged all of the sightings, all of the animals that were killed. And in the last reported by 10% of our 92845 population, which is on our website, just reported. We have 17 animals killed, three dogs attacked who survived at great cost. We um, have countless sightings, countless encounters. And I agree with Christine. They have more rights at this point than we do. This is not an urban area. We don't back up to wildland. We never had this problem before. We don't know what happened. We don't know of the construction on Catella. We don't know of the freeway construction. But over the last couple of years, it's gotten bad. We've had um, oh, um, fish and game to one of our neighborhood meetings. You were there that night, Chris Beard, mm -hmm. Councilman Beard. And we, he, he gave us great information. But that does not protect our animals in their own backyards. They cannot be out there unattended. Our dogs are licensed, they're vaccinated, they're kept on leashes, and they're restricted, they're confined, they're in prison. They cannot enjoy the yards again. I have brought tonight some information. That's the one. This is Los Alamitos. This is in August of last year. They had one dog, a coyote scale defense. The dog was killed, and the city immediately contacted the weapon station got permission and trapped and removed those animals immediately, if you want that information. What city did that happen in? Los Alamitos. One, ant, one dog, and they responded. Um, Laguna Beach had severe problems, Laguna Woods. We had a woman who got hurt when a coyote tried to take her dog while she was walking it on a leash. And they hired a hunter. And eventually it, they hunted down... 10 of the coyotes and remove them. They don't just go after small dogs. Here's a pit bull that was attacked by a coyote. Um, this is where Laguna Beach changed their ordinance to allow for the hunter to work within certain time limits. We have a post from our website, our Facebook page. This gentleman backs up to Bell. You can't see this picture. I'll give you all of this information. But here's the fence for the baseball field. The gutter runs along the back. There's coyotes here. Um, during the closure of Bell, they pretty much moved in there, and every night they were over there howling. And they're there. This gentleman says he sees them. He's seen them 50 times this year. So they're, they've taken up residence in the schoolyard. And now we have children. We have all the drainage ditches. We took a lot of pictures of the shape the drainage ditches are in. And, and of course, that doesn't really solve the problem since they do scale eight-foot fences like Kim has testified to. Um, way too many problems. Way too many problems. I don't know if you can do anything about the fences. But we need to do something. And we're asking you guys, you know, we were told... Okay, report sightings to animal control. They keep a map. I called animal control to report a sighting of a coyote. They told me that. I said, what do you do? And she said, well, we don't. If there's a coyote in a schoolyard, we'll come and chase it away. I said, do you keep a sighting map? Well, I'll take it if you want me to. There's no, yeah, there's no. And like Christine said, if we had a pack of wild animals, 
wild dogs, street dogs, running our streets, no matter what they were, and they were creating havoc, we would act, they would act, they would do something. If we had a bear, they would tranquilize it and move it. And we're asking for some kind of solution to this problem because we, this is just not, this is just not acceptable. Sharon, you're out of time. I'm sorry. Lisa McCurdy. Good evening. Uh, I'm not very good at winging it, so I'm just going to read what I wrote down earlier. Um, I was born and raised in Eastgate on the west side of Garden Grove, uh, just behind Eastgate Park. And I lived in Garden Grove most of my life, and I've been a resident in Garden Park now for the past 18 years. And I've never heard of a coyote, coyote sighting in our area uh, until about two years ago. Now, just so you know where I'm coming from here, I'm what, I'm what you might call an intense animal lover. Uh, in my youth, I managed pet stores. I've raised every kind of domestic animal at some point in my life, uh, most of them right here in Garden Grove. And I have several dogs and cats now that I fostered, rehomed, helped facilitate adoption of dozens of dogs and cats over the years. And I'm also a card-carrying member of three organizations that advocate animal rights, including the Humane Society of the United States. Now, knowing a little bit about my background might help you understand how hard it is for me to stand up here today um, because I struggled with this a lot. But uh, I think that we need to eradicate the coyotes on the west side of Garden Grove. Um, I, I would hope that it would be done as humanely as possible, but something definitely has to be done. It's like an epidemic over there. Um, now, I know that there's been a lot of debating about uh, the situation of late, and all the animal advocates will tell you, like the video that we saw earlier, um, which I found very humorous, uh, but they'll tell you that the only way to get the coyotes out of your neighborhood is to haze them. Uh, and the coyotes have become pretty much nocturnal in our area, so we rarely see them. So how are you expected to haze them when they're primarily they're hunting in the wee hours of the morning and we're all sleeping? Um, and just this morning, there's a, there's a couple of neighborhood websites but just this morning, I read a post from a lady named Kim uh, who lives in College Park East. And I just want to read you a little excerpt of what she said. She said, uh, uh, I'll quote, In July, coyotes jumped over our six-foot backyard wall and took our chihuahua, Ruby, of 15 years. In the middle of the night, Ruby had used her dog door to go potty. She was six feet from her dog door when the expletive took her. I heard it happen. Ruby did not deserve this in any way. She was an angel that I cry for every day." End quote. Now, I could stand here and tell you all about the countless incidents that my neighbors often relay to me about their pets being attacked and being killed. And I know that we don't have that kind of time, but it is a constant event now in our neighborhoods. And I know it sounds awful to purposely kill a wild animal that really isn't doing anything against its natural instinct. But, and this sounds harsh, but until you've heard the screams from your family pet while it's being torn apart, as many people have, or witness with your own eyes your dog or cat being ripped to shreds in front of you, you can't possibly imagine the trauma that you'll experience and the hurt that you'll always carry with you. Now, I'm one of the lucky ones who's not yet lost a pet, and I would very much like to remain that way. You know, if a coyote killed one of my dogs or both of my dogs, it would probably flip a switch inside of me, a very angry switch. Uh, I've always been a law-abiding citizen, and I want to continue to do things legally, and I'm sure that most of the people here tonight feel the same way, and that's why we're asking for your help to eliminate these coyotes in our neighborhoods. Uh, we would like for the officials to handle this matter and not force the residents to handle it on their own because a lot of them are getting to that point where it's kind of a last straw situation. And then lastly, my husband uh, brought this up to me today. He said that Orange County has an animal services department and obviously one of their duties is animal control. 
And he asked the question, so why can't they control the animals that are terrorizing our neighborhoods? And he went on to the animal services website, and there uh, they have stated seven duties of the field services division in that department, and two of the seven duties that he highlighted, uh, one said protects the public from aggressive and suspected rabid animals, and another point was that one of their duties is ensures the safety and well-being of animals in our community. So I know that they've brought that point up a couple times tonight, but again, if there were some aggressive dogs or something roaming our streets, something would absolutely be done. And the fact that these are wild, I don't know why it's any different. Thank you. Lieutenant Kent Smerrill. Is Lieutenant here? You Could you please come forward? Sure. I think two will do the job. Well, who are you with, sir? I work for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And, I'm a lieutenant, 58 years here in Garden Grove resident. So um, I feel their pain. One of the guys says that uh, they need a plan. Uh, we had uh, we started originally with, with some uh, a forum that the city put on a couple months ago. And we didn't go the next step. And it sounds like we need to go there. We're here to guide the city. What would be the next step? The next step, well, first of all, we're, there's a meeting on the f November 5th in West Garden Grove at Bob Snell's house. I re already talked to him. So we do need to put a plan together. I've been in touch with some of the residents there. One of them, Bob, he called me, told me all the stuff that's going on. Um, I've got some comments, but you guys are emotional right now, rightfully so. If it was my dog that that happened, I'd be the same way. So I'm not even going to go there with you. I'm right there well, with you. Well, go talk to me. All right. Okay. Uh, I mean, what's the problem with uh, having somebody hunt these dogs down and eradicating them? What's the problem? Uh, yes. Okay. First of all, the coyotes are there because they're getting fed. You can, you can, many cities have done different things, but the ones that have been most successful decide if they do want to have a trapping program within their city, it will not work unless there's an educational program. That educational program is done through a program that we call Wildlife Watch. It teams up with a neighborhood watch program within the city, and it teaches the residents how to separate emotion from fact and understand the life history and the habits of coyotes. Where they're at right now is you've got some, probably got some habituated coyotes in there that have been flushed out from the, the work that's being done in the 405, 605 what's a, interchange. What's a habituated an habituated coyote is a coyote that has lost its natural fear of humans. And it's done so because there has been food left out. Pets, cat food, pet food, people that feed cats, could be trash, could be fruit, could be water, could be various things that attract the coyotes into the neighborhood. Unknowingly, the residents do this. They live in their yards. They put their pets in the backyard, assuming that they are going to be safe. The reality of it is, is a coyote will scale a six-foot fence to get your pet. The education is not going to take place, or I should say, the stopping this will not happen if somebody comes in and does trap a few coyotes without the education. This takes a collective effort from everybody in the community, and they need to understand and work together as a team. Otherwise, it will not happen. It will cause the city, cost the city a lot of money. That's why we do not recommend trapping to start immediately. When it happens, okay, like what happened in Cyprus. Okay, okay, why would it cost the city a lot of money? Because you're going to have to hire a trapper. We don't come in and do that. We're not going to do that for you. Game won't trap them. Only if there is a situation that, that like happened in Cyprus a couple well, months ago. It's certainly apparent to me that the, the coyotes live on that naval base down there and come up through the various waterways to do it. Is there any law against us going down there to the and eradicating them? You going on on their property and or a cat uh, erect? Naval base. You don't want to do that. Well, yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> You're wrong there. I want to do it. 
I just don't know if it's legal or not or, or that. You know. The legalities of it, okay. You can definitely talk. There is a wildlife reserve on there. You can talk with those folks there, and we'd be happy to work with, with you on that. But it's not a four-legged problem that you have, sir. And they don't want to hear this, and you folks may not want to hear it, but I'm going to tell you it's a two-legged problem. It's our problem, and we created it. But the reality of it is is that the coyotes have gone too far now. They're in your neighborhoods. They're taking your pets, and something does need to be done about it. And we will work with you. We'll, we'll give you recommendations. We'll put a plan together. But this is not a one-time thing. This is going to happen every season. And I've been doing this for 30 years and have spoken probably 25 to 30 different cities and heard all the complaints. I feel for these people. But the reality of it is, is that you've got coyotes that are living in Garden Grove right now and they're coming into this area. And the way to get rid of them is you got to cut off their food supply. You do that, they'll leave. What happens is, is their natural reproductive rate will go up based on how much food they get. And right now they're getting pet food, they're getting cats, and they're getting small dogs. And that has to stop. And it's going to have to take a community to do this. And right now you got people that are very upset, rightfully so. It's going to take education. And if the city does decide to do some trapping, you need to decide how far you want to go with it. And you need to work with, it needs to be a licensed trapper with our department and we'll work with you from that standpoint. But as it's been talked about here. What if we decide to hire our own trappers? You can walk? do that. You have the ability to do that. You have the ability to do that. And some cities do it. I'm just telling you that your Belinda's done it. Sometimes it needs to be done. Okay. And that's what the purpose of Wildlife Watch is. It's getting in there and bringing the community in to become part of the solution and work with the city government your flood control district, okay, as well, because those are the highways and byways where these animals move. Fencing is an issue, too. And that's where it takes a total approach from all the agencies working together. That's the concept of Wildlife Watch. It's a collective approach. And right now, you're in an emotional stage right now. Rightfully understand that. We're here to help you, okay? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. I'd like to... Uh agendize this. Uh, I think it takes four votes to agendize this. Is that correct? Where's our lawyer? To discuss it tonight? For a future meeting or right now? Future. Right now. Can't you just agendize it? I can't agendize it unless four of us agree to agendize it, I think. I think it would be appropriate to agendize for a future meeting. Yeah. I understand that. I have the ability to agendize it myself for a future meeting. I'd like to talk about it now and maybe go some direction right now. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I wasn't prepared for that. Let me look into it and let you move on and let me get back to you in just a well, second. Well, I know it's doable. I mean, it's been done before. Well, this is what I'd like. I, I think we need to come up with a program. I mean, uh, I've heard several coyote uh, problems in, in our city. But this is, this is massive over on the west side. And I think we need to do something about it. I think we need to trap them. I, I personally like the idea of putting poison out for them. You know, uh, I mean, it has to be done. If we lose one child, if we lose one child over this, shame on me and shame on anybody else who didn't do something about it. So... Uh, I'd like to come up with a plan, and I'd like to bring it to the council as soon as possible. Move on it immediately. And if we have to have a special council meeting to do it, that I can call. Mr. Mayor, uh, if I may. So the, the rule is is that um, requires four votes. You're correct. Um, the, you need to make a finding that there's need to take immediate action and that the need for action came to the attention of the city subsequent to the agenda being posted. Uh, if that's uh, true and those findings can be made, um, you can agendize uh, uh, the item for discussion and action. Hey, Mr. Mayor, just uh, because some things are already put in motion, apparently there's a neighborhood meeting November 2nd, and they're going to discuss November 2nd the is three weeks. November 5th is three weeks from now. It's too late. Okay. I just wanted to. Okay. 
Keep a lip on it, sir. We'll handle this, okay? Uh, what do you say? Carry on. Carry on. Uh, yeah, I like to come up with something very quick on this. I don't want it three weeks, four weeks now. I like to do it within a week. I'd like to have you meet with the chief of police and maybe meet with the fish and game and come up with a program that we can implement on the west side of this town and eradicate the coyotes. Um, in doing so, would a study session on the 22nd be a form that you would like or just bring it right on the agenda? Uh, That's why I want to agendize it now. Well, I mean, come up with a plan. Do something. At least come back to us with a plan. Right. So I'm, I'm suggesting that could be done in a study session prior to the meeting or just bring it on the uh, regular. So just giving you an option as far as the forum. Uh, have first of all, I'd like to know what options we really have. Now, we heard from the lieutenant that there were certain options. But I think we can go further with them. I can think, how soon can we, how soon can we hire a trapper? How soon can we... Do some immediate action on it. That's what I'd like to know. Can you get that information for us within a week? Yes. Can we have a special city council meeting next Tuesday? Yes. On this single issue? I'd like to do all that. Anybody want to change my mind? She asked you a question. What's the difference between a trapper and a hunter? I'd like to have the answer to that next Tuesday. You know, so can we put a, a schedule of meeting for next Tuesday? Yes. Please. Is that a vote? I'll vote for that. Uh, just another question. It doesn't have to be a vote. I, I can I can do that. I have certain powers, very few, but certain. Well, I'm going to second if it's a uh, question. Is um, uh, I'd like if we consider this to have a, the full gamut of the full program that he was talking about: education, the extremes, uh, maybe an uh, assessment of what the problem is. We've heard from these citizens. I firmly believe them. I live in that end of town, so I know there are uh, that's that's a, a issue out there. So uh, if, to be inclusive of that program or that study session to uh, also consider the, the full range of education. I was hoping we could have a community forum. In fact, when I left the uh, neighborhood watch where this was brought up, this was a uh, well discussed, uh, but it wasn't enough time. It's very, very much a, um, a layered approach, if you could say that. And so I'd like to see the whole array of uh, options that we have. Including we'll identify that as many as we can. And, uh, and, and also to explain to citizens what we have done and what we're looking into as well. Because they have, we've initiated something here in the city, but we, I think we need to bring it out where the problem is too. So I was hoping we could consider a community forum in the West End of Garden Grove as well. Time is on the coyote side. <laughs> I'm, you know, we, we might it, refer it to it as Wiley or something, right. but you know, uh, I just can't see wasting too much time. How about next Wednesday night? Can we do it next Wednesday night? Is there a problem with Tuesday? Yeah, I'm, I'm not available next Tuesday. We can do it next Wednesday. Okay, I'd like to schedule them. Uh, October 16th. That would be great. And I'd like to come back with as many, many, as many suggestions. I'd like it to be open to the public. Okay. Okay, thank you. At this time, we're going to take a five-minute break. Thank you. We have cake, Mr. Mayor. If now is a good time to do cake. Next Wednesday, 6 o'clock, right? I guess so. Okay. All accounted for. Okay, at this time we're going to recess the city council and we'll go to the uh, can the successor agency's business. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to call the October 8th meeting of the successor agency to order. Madam Clerk, would you like to call roll? Member Broadwater. Here. Member Wynn. Here. Member Fawn. Here. Vice Chair Beard. Here. Chair Jones. Here. We had a closed session item with legal counsel, but we have nothing to report. Um, oral communications we did in conjunction with city council, so consent items. I move to approve. Second. All the vote. Motion received five yes votes. Okay, we have no public hearings. Uh, items for consideration, item 6A. Mr. Chairman, 6A is a consideration of an implementation agreement for the development of the Water Park Hotel 
And Mr. Greg Blodgett is here to give a staff report on this item. Thank you, Mr. Fratell. Mr. Chair, members of the successor agency, this item is to consider and adopt a resolution approving the implementation agreement between the successor agency and Garden Grove MXD, Inc., for the development of the Water Park Hotel. The successor agency has completed all of its conditions prior to closing escrow, including acquiring the site, relocating the tenants, and relocating on-site ut utilities, and is now ready to convey the land to the developer. The attached implementation agreement is now needed prior to closing of escrow. The implementation agreement fulfills <coughs> two purposes. First, it provides for the approval and transfer of the property under the DDA. Second, Section 4A obligates successor agency to pay the developer $5 million upon commencement and start of the construction of the parking structure and $42 million uh, 30 days after the hotel opens for business. Uh, successor agency and developer now desire to enter into the implementation agreement for purposes of providing the covenants, uh, conveyance of the site pursuant to Health and Safety Code 34181A to establish in accordance with Section 48481 of the DDA the successor agency's contingencies to issuance tax allocation bonds to uh, pay the remaining covenant consideration required by Section 48 of the DDA. Uh, at this time, staff recommends that the successor agency adopt the attached resolution approving the implementation agreement by and between the successor agency and Garden Grove MXD, Inc. Uh, this concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Move the issue. Second. Call the vote. Motion received five yes votes. Any matters from agency members? Seeing none, we're adjourned back to City Council. Okay, at this time we'll reconvene the City Council and we'll go to consent items. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, you have items 6A through 6D to be acted on simultaneously unless a separate action is requested by a council member. Entertain a motion. Move to approve. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Call for the vote. Motion received <clears throat> five yes votes. Matters from uh, Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager. Uh, first, I'd like to have a report on the travel to Sister City Anyang. Uh, would you start that off for us, Mr. Uh, Chris Baird? Yeah, I was a member of the delegation that went and visited, and I uh, found it to be very informative and very educational. Uh, we did our, uh, I did the ceremony of duties uh, representing the city uh, with the with our sister city. I had an opportunity to review uh, city. Facilities there in Anyang, again, is very interesting, very informative. I hope to apply those things that I learned at, at, on that trip. Uh, I was particularly impressed with the um, museum and their operations at all the locations. Uh, I was uh, interested in uh, all the marketing that's been done and the sustainability of those um, uh, museums. So I found that worthwhile, and I hope to apply and pass along that information to city staff. I'm sure I can use it in the future as a council member. Um, it was... Um, I couldn't ask for a warmer welcome, very gracious host that we have as a sister city, and I intend to um, enhance my efforts to promote the sister city program with the students. I was impressed with the reaction and response from the city officials, how they are so supportive of our sister city program, but also the student exchange program that I find very worthwhile, and uh, I had... Um, I have nothing but good things to say, and I, I brought back, again, a lot of information I hope to apply in my city council position. Dina. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm also part of the delegation to Anyang, and the purpose of the trip to Anyang was to celebrate Anyang's 40th anniversary celebration. Um, we briefly stopped by Hawaii, uh, where we spent um, about a day uh, observing and visiting the war memorials um, uh, called the Arizona, um, which was uh, one of the ships that was shot during World War I. I was very impressed with um, the museum, and um, I saw a lot of uh, applications that they applied uh, in that museum that probably could be applied in the Vietnam War Museum here. Um, after that, we went straight to the city of um, An Young and uh, stopped over Seoul first, where we saw another museum. It was a military museum, which is very much in line with the Vietnam War Museum. Um, saw some of the displays that they have. I think they're, um, uh, it's good to see uh, the real 
live display because we've talked about it in the Vietnam War Museum but never really see the real display of how things could be um, presented to uh, um, the public or an audience. So um, that was a very um, an insight for the Vietnam War Museum. Um, the sister uh, city of Anyang was very uh, gracious to us and uh, accepted our welcome us with a lot of hospitalities and more than we could I have seen we offered to them uh, and um, well maybe because they have more of the ability to do so in their bigger city they have about 620,000 people but what I did learn through this delegation is um, that it's good to exchange culture and it's good to exchange um, information um, uh, the city is, is um, really concerned with job creations, so Anyang has a big hand in the um, development of industries, where we have a big hand in the development of the tourist industry. Um, it's good to compare those two. And then they have children programs um, that they have in the city, uh, run by certain departments in the city, but what I learn about this time is they have a senior program that is catered to seniors, um, depression and isolation and how to um, prevent that and I thought that was a good thing um, that I learned and maybe I can talk to staff and um, the council in the future about maybe applying that in the city of Garden Grove. I, I really appreciate the trip and the opportunity to be there. I'm um, very thankful we ha I had that opportunity and hopefully what I've learned and in, on this trip um, will be very helpful in my future um, representation of the city and in applying uh, many of the new programs. Thank you very much. Chris, uh, Chris Fahm, I'm sorry. I, I was uh, not able to join the delegation to Hawaii due to my work schedule, but I did join the delegation in, in uh, Korea. I was very impressed with everything that I saw from the war museum that uh, Dina talked about. For me, I was really touched because we went to visit a Navy base uh, that was the second fleet for the Republic of Korea, and we were briefed by a one-star admiral. And um, since we speak the same language, uh, I was really impressed with how they are basically on the top of their game when it comes to response to foreign threats. And the museum that they put together was really wonderful. It was basically a, a shape of a ship. So when you walk through the museum, you felt like you were on the deck of an actual ship. And so that was uh, some, something I really enjoyed. As far as for meeting with all the other uh, elected officials in the city, I was very impressed with how uh, much uh, graciousness we were received and how we were given. And the one point I did make was you know, with the military background that uh, I've been in, I don't think we can even match them with as much precision and accuracy that they delivered in terms of all the banners they provided, all the reception, and just the details they showed to welcoming our delegation. Uh, I do want to also say thank you to our wonderful staff, Ms. Uh, Maria Stipes and Ms. Uh, Janie Lee, who were our escorts on this, this trip. We couldn't have gotten around without them. And also to our wonderful Ms. Uh, Garden Grove, who provided the uh, performing arts pro uh, portion at the festival. Um, we had uh, presentations where we as a city presented uh, amongst seven other cities who were also sister cities, invited there for the Anyan's 40th anniversary. And at the set risk of sounding biased, I thought that we were the, the most well put together, uh, most well represented. And as far as the video that our uh, Channel 3 put together by Jeff Davis and Maria, it was very impressive. And even though we gave the shortest presentation of all the cities, by far I think we were the slickest and the best of all th of the seven cities. So thank you, everyone. <clears throat> I also went to the... Uh process of uh, going to uh, Hawaii and Korea. Hawaii, I went to the museums. I went to the, see the Big Mo uh, Missouri ship. Uh, the Navy still runs it and everything else, but the, it is a floating museum, and the museum is run by a private sector organization of volunteers. It's done very well. They really put that, uh, the, the way they go through it and explain everything to you, and they just have a volume of knowledge and information. The Missouri was the ship that the uh, Japanese declared, uh, the Japanese signed the end of the war at, and uh, the Missouri was the ship, and the reason it was picked, it was one of the four biggest battleships that the uh, United States had at the end of the World War II, and uh, of course the new president, Harry Truman, was from Missouri, so that's why they picked the Missouri. 
Uh, I enjoyed the Arizona also. I, I thought it was very humble and uh, put together very nice. And uh, you knew you were really walking on sacred, sacred area when you walked on that Arizona platform. It was done very well. However, my trip to Korea did not go well at all. I got sick on the airplane, and uh, within an hour and a half after reaching Korea, I was admitted to the uh, uh, ER at the uh, University ho uh, Hospital downtown Seoul. I uh, spent the night in the hospital, and uh, I had to make a decision. Uh, they were going to do some processes on me to find out why I was losing so much blood, and uh, I chose to go home and have it done here. And uh, I'm really glad that I did. Uh, I, I felt very comfortable with the processes of the hospital in, in Korea. I didn't see anything much different than what we have here. However, there were a lot of differences. Uh, I was in a room with six people, and uh, that's sort of rare in, in California anymore. And also, the, me the pharmaceutical, the medicines I take right now for my heart, they didn't understand them at all, didn't know what they were for, and... I could not quit taking them, uh, and they needed me to quit taking them through the process according to them, and so I decided to come home. So actually I was only in Korea 24 hours, in and out, and I have to admit I was glad to be home. I, getting sick overseas is not a fun thing. Uh, Kaiser was almost waiting for me at the airport. Uh, they did a fantastic job of figuring out what was wrong with me, explaining to me it's really not too big a thing. But uh, it, you couldn't tell me that when the blood was coming out. So uh, worked well. I'm pretty pretty well right now and happy camper to be home. Uh, I I do think that we do learn things on these trips, just like the old folks home that she was talking about, that Dean was talking about. I think it's good for us to examine other other places where they do things differently than we do. And so it was a good trip all the way around. Mr. Baird, would you like to have anything further to say this evening? Yes, I would like to say happy birthday to Councilman Steve Jones. Thank you. And then also before our next meeting, we will be, um, I just want to remind citizens that October 17th is the Great California Shakeout. So if you don't participate in the drill, which they ask you to drop, uh, cover, and hold on, uh, it's going to be October 17th. It's 10, 17 a.m. I don't know, do we practice that as a city? Get under our desks and hold on. Well, we should encourage citizens to do so. Yeah, it's, let's start at the top of the city manager holding on under his desk. So, uh, if you don't participate in that drill per se, I think that's a good time to reflect and see, take inventory of what you have in stock for emergency preparedness at home. It will happen eventually. We'll have a, a major earthquake, so it is inevitable. Scientists have told us that. So be prepared. That's the Boy Scout coming out of me. Be prepared at home. Check your uh, supplies and, and stock up. And so I do that, and that's all I have. Thank you. Dana? Yes. Happy birthday, Member Jones. And don't forget to buy and garden grow, especially with Halloween coming up. I just want to share that today I had the opportunity to uh, speak on behalf of our city at the uh, Korean American B Business Expo here in, in, at the MC Suite. It was a very uh, well put together expo and very proud to uh, represent the city and speak on what we're doing so great. I did mention to them that I feel kind of like the uh, queen at the ball because I mentioned about all the great works being done with the water park and the hotels. And of course, I wasn't on the council for any of this, but here I am probably going to be there for the groundbreaking and the, uh, rib the ribbon cutting. So I feel very, very blessed. And also, uh, just want to remind the city that uh, this Saturday, I am going to uh, be judging the uh, Miss Garden Grove pageant. A very wise mayor told me that I should not have probably volunteered to do that because I may lose votes. But uh, <laughs> at the risk of doing that, you know how much I'd like to have fun. So I'll be there from 6.30 to 9 o'clock this Saturday at the, Mar the Marriott Suite on the corner of uh, Chapman and, uh, and uh, Harbor. So please come out and join me at that time. Stephen. Yeah, I just want to say welcome back to all my uh, fellow council members. I hope you enjoyed the trip and stayed here and held down the fort while you guys were gone. I know we have a big um, big and vibrant Korean business district in this town, and um, so there's a lot of commercial square footage of, of retail and commercial Korean-owned um, space, and yet there's a relatively little Korean population. That's something we need to put our minds to work at, try and figure out how do we help them in their rebranding efforts to 
kind of maybe bring more residential population of uh, Koreans here into town to help support that commercial base and or help them reposition it to be um, to last and be sustainable into the future. So it's good it's good that we go over there, experience the culture, experience the people, get to know our sister city, um, Anyang, and, uh, and that's probably helpful in our quest for helping our own city, a, a portion of our own city in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say happy birthday to Jones. How old are you, Jones? Four five. Four five? Oh, you don't even look like three five. Doing good. Anyway, there is a uh, uh, a used book sale at the Historical Society this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's a massive amount of uh, good books, very, very inexpensive. I would advise anybody that does read books to make a stop there. Uh, I just am thankful to be home, and I'm thankful for, to, for all the blessings that are bestowed upon our city, and I think that uh, we've done well. And I want to close tonight and, uh, and say that we will be back next Wednesday night to see what we can do with those coyotes. Thank you very much.